Hey guys, Matt. Uh, chapter 21 continues the theme started with the Statue of Liberty lie. This entire section starting with Statue of Liberty lie, you could plop somebody down in front of these chapters and say, you think you understand the basics of what life in this country is all about? You understand none of it, and everything presented to you is a fraud. So let's continue with those themes. Before I do, uh, just a quick comment on the last chapter, some of the comments I saw. And I'll start the reading in just about 45 seconds. Um, I knew it. You know, you mentioned Jordan Maxwell. People come out of the woodwork. He's a shill. He's this. He's a Freemason. Like, like, like I just fell off the uh, truth turnip truck. You know, like I have no, I, this is all news to me. You know, I, I was making Sandy Hook videos like a week after it happened. Oh, okay, this, is, this stuff is not new to me. If I hear Jordan Maxwell present something, and the segment in which he's presenting is true, like relating money to water, it doesn't matter then who he is, what his background is, whether he played with a rubber ducky, it doesn't matter, because this, the piece I took was true. If it's pouring rain outside and Jordan Maxwell says it's raining, oh, we can't listen to him, he's a shill, you understand? Uh, let's just start the reading. Chapter 21 is several topics. They move quickly. It starts with the Washington Monument. About 90% of people, when you ask them, what is the Washington Monument, they'll stop for a second. And, oh, well, it's a monument, uh, I don't know, you know, for Washington. Only probably about 30 to 40% will be sure it's a dedication for the man, not for the city. Well, that's the official story either way. You'll see the Washington Monument is neither. Here's a great, great question to pose a D.C. tourist. Why did they use a giant penis to honor George Washington? The monument is an Egyptian obelisk. The obelisk represents the phallus of Osiris. It's a dick. Period. Even Dr. Indiana Jones could afford no alternative interpretation of the Egyptian-style obelisk. The obelisk has roots in ancient Egypt, but in modern use it's very Freemasonic, or of the Freemasons, of which George Washington was one. At the top of the Washington Monument is pretty much the same pyramid that's on the back of the dollar bill. Obviously, if this country was just out to honor the first president of the United States, they would have done something similar to what exists today, for example, the Lincoln Memorial, or the Martin Luther King Memorial. As the ghost of George Washington, would you be pleased to learn you were honored with the world's largest dick? Obviously, a giant obelisk has nothing to do with George the man. I don't care what the official dedication says. I don't care what Wikipedia says. Why would I buy anything regarding the official story of what the Washington Monument represents? It's likely the Freemasons build a tribute to themselves. They laugh as a million tourists go up into it, like semen. Yeah, with 99% of the tourists not having the first clue about all the symbolism they're absolutely surrounded by throughout all of Washington, D.C. Living under maritime admiralty law, the good little citizens going up to the top of the Washington Monument are semen. The point is, how is it possible we've never heard what I just presented? Is there actually somebody right now making desperate or pathetic excuses trying to downplay the symbolism of an obelisk, of an Egyptian obelisk, that has no other interpretation than what I just discussed? The dick. I mean, just, I'm going off script here. Think about that. It has no other interpretation but a phallus. It's its ancient roots. They erected a gigantic dick. This is easily researched. Nobody talks about it. People say, where can we get good hot dogs? A good, give me, show me a good hot dog vendor. Our kids are hungry. It's unbelievable. Sure, like the genius Freemasons of the era didn't realize the ancient roots of what an obelisk is. They just thought it was a pretty shape. And the fact that it's 6,660 inches tall, 6660 inches tall, that means nothing either. 
This part is an addendum to a few chapters back on the pagan ritual of Christmas. This is Santa Claus and the Christmas tree. Now this is so big it had to be covered separately from the prior section. 99% of people carrying in a Christmas tree have no idea it has absolutely nothing to do with Christ. In fact, it's worse than that from a Christian perspective. It's honoring pagan rite, which means pagan gods, like Thor, Odin, Kronos, etc. In fact, it gets even worse, because the book of Jeremiah in the Bible says, Do not be like the heathen. Do not cut down a tree, and do not adorn it with silver and gold. Many versions of the Bible, other than the King James, say, Do not be like the nations. But there's no question this passage is telling Christians to not be like pagans. Here, nations eagle equals pagans. Do not be like the nations. Do not be like the pagans. It's the same thing. Remember, I'm not saying a Christmas tree is good or bad. I'm not, uh, I'm not slamming its Norse roots or anything like that. No, I'm just pointing out that hundreds of millions of Christians don't understand a bit of the symbolism. And I'm not even going after Christians. I'm saying the fact that hundreds of millions of people go through this every December and nobody talks about it. It's never presented on the news. Nobody ever points it out. In other words, it's hidden to some degree. It's just one more incredible example that our entire reality is being manipulated by something. Because this is so easily researched, it's, it's ridiculous. Now I'm also asking, how is it possible that nobody who buys a tree knows what they're doing in buying it? Away from the occult origins of the evergreen, every time I pass a Christmas tree seller in a shopping center, I say aloud from inside my car, that right there is tree Auschwitz. Now, I say that as a joke, but it is truly, it saddens me. I am appalled by the killing of millions and millions of trees and living things, uh, just so the dying thing can sit in somebody's room for two weeks and then be thrown in the trash. That really, really saddens me. But let's move on. Let's think about what was just said for a moment. The Bible itself says not to have a Christmas tree. And tens of millions or more Christians do it every year to honor Jesus? What? Now, most will say, it's, it's just innocent. They'll say, uh, people just don't know what really it, it says in Jeremiah 10. Or they've uh, misinterpreted. They've misinterpreted Jeremiah 10. Remember, this book, this book I'm reading is about exposing an underlying reality. So, quite simply, how is it possible hundreds of millions of good Christians around the world engage, engage in multiple accounts of pagan ritual, on not during the year, but on the, at the exact time they're supposed to be celebrating Jesus' birthday? What the F is going on? Not that they're doing it, why nobody talks about it. Nobody cares about the little old Ten Commandments? Thou shalt have no other gods before me? A Christmas tree is the symbol of choosing other gods. This isn't a conspiracy theory. It's indisputable with basic research. The other defense I've heard, and what you'll likely find on the internet, is that my interpretation of the book of Jeremiah is simply wrong. And that's not really what it says. This is a desperate, pathetic response, in my opinion. There is no mystery to what the Bible says in this passage. Anybody can just go read a few sentences, open up a King James Bible, uh, hopefully it's not Mandela affected, and just read. It's pretty clear. If I say the Bible also says a bush was on fire, could somebody argue that I misinterpreted it? You can go right to Exodus 3 and read the words. For those who don't know, that's a little known part in the Bible where Moses is up on a mountain. And just a note to close this section, uh, when I talked about in the Bible, it says don't be like the heathen, don't be like the nations, don't adorn a tree in silver and gold. I thought about that fat little Santa Claus in Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, the, the old animated or claymation or whatever it was. What does he sing? Burl Ives. What does he sing? 
silver and gold, silver and gold. It's that little, I don't know how that little fat snowman moves through the snow. There's no legs or anything. But that's what he sings. And would a Christian be right in interpreting that as them putting it in our faces? Yeah, pretty much. Next reality breakdown section. How is it possible the United States has been in Iraq and Afghanistan for almost a combined half a century? What the f? Please know and remember this important point. The United States fought the Nazis directly in World War II for just over one year. Direct and hard fighting, all that General Patton stuff, for just about one year. 1944-1945. I also admit the definition of in Afghanistan and in Iraq is a bit loose here. Kind of like in Dixie. For example, I added to the time frame 1980 to 1989 where the U.S. was supporting Osama bin Laden's Mujahideen fighting the Soviet invasion, pushing them back, uh, supporting Tim Osmond or Donny Osmond or whatever his CIA code name was and Zygnu Brzezinski and his beautiful daughter Mika Brzezinski were involved. I included that. Why shouldn't direct involvement in in Afghanistan or or sorry indirect involvement what's it's still meddling in Afghanistan we've been doing it for we I've got to get out of that habit the United States has been doing it for 50 years so absolutely I did include that time frame Iraq and Afghanistan the United States is pushing about a combined half century of occupation in these two Middle Eastern paradises how is that possible how is it nobody by now are really starting to question it, starting to push back, starting to get upset. I mean, something else is going on. And the the confusing thing is why the people around us can't see it. If you go out to the park and you ask 100 people what the United States is doing in these two hell holes, pushing a quarter century each, uh, they'll parrot back to you about the same old bullshit they've downloaded from the Matrix night after night from the news. Um, well, we're fighting terrorism. Really? That may have made sense about 16 or 17 years ago, but does it make sense today? No matter what you believe, the official story regarding what happened in 2001? Let's just do the basic math. The United States defeated Saddam Hussein in Gulf War I, and they did it in three days once the ground attack was launched. Three days. The U.S. won Gulf War II in a few weeks, And that one finally led to Saddam's death. The U.S. defeated the Taliban in about five months in in Afghanistan, shortly after 9-11, with very little direct engagement, mostly just by assisting the Kurdish Northern Alliance from the air with a few special forces on the ground. We're told the special forces on the ground actually rode around on horses, defeated the Taliban in five months. So we have a total of six months of combat to defeat the main enemy in Afghanistan and twice in Iraq. <laughs> That's three, three engagements, six months total. But the U.S. is now pushing a combined 50 years of involvement in these two countries. Now why doesn't somebody ask what the hell for? It's like a man hooking up with a woman on a Saturday night in 1976 after coming home from Studio 54 and finally getting his stuff out of her apartment in the year 2010. Actually, that analogy is wrong. We are still fully in Afghanistan and Iraq in 2018, the time of this writing. So the analogy is better suited here. It's really like a man in this example who met the woman in 1976 at Studio uh, 54. It's like him never taking his stuff out of her apartment and even then encouraging his son to move in after his death. Actually, this chapter needs an addendum. Because we've now been involved in Syria for about five years, let's add that to our total, giving us well over a combined 50 years for three countries in the Middle East. Actually, Should we add in the time spent fighting Libya over nothing and assisting the Saudis to kill thousands of Bedouins in Yemen? Right now, then, it's up to 57 years of combined war in the Middle East. George Washington would be proud, and it brings a no-foreign-entanglement patriotic tear to my eye. 
Think about this sick image for a moment. There will soon be two generations of Afghanis who know nothing else in their lives but to have American troops occupying their country. Think about that. Perhaps that was the ultimate intention all along. If you can't really beat them, just get them used to you so they stop setting up roadside bombs. An entire population now believes it's like completely normal to see Black Hawk helicopters overhead like we see crows in the backyard. It's kind of like the seagulls becoming habituated to the people on the beach digging in their umbrellas in Atlantic City. Will somebody be reading this book or listening to what I'm saying in the year 2025 or 2032? And will we still be in Afghanistan and Iraq? And will people still think it's completely normal? And uh, we're still getting those terrorists? What's your friggin' threshold? That's the end of the reading, but just some related notes at the end. Um, Somehow, amazingly, uh, especially now with additional subscribers, there are some actual Trump supporters who show up here and make comments. Not many, but there are a few. And if there are any Trump supporters uh, listening to this, um, please... Please, uh, it's not about supporting Trump or being against Hillary. Or you, you guys have to realize, um, politics as it's presented to us is 100% fake. Okay, these are basically actors fulfilling a role, playing a part. I mean, there is no other way to describe it. If anything about it was real, regarding Trump. Um, I get every so often I get a message like he's really working on on our side. I guess well, how many years do we have to wait before he actually does something or restores one infringement or impingement into the Bill of Rights? Still waiting for that. But uh, if anything was real, like I've said before, he would have gone and taken that podium at the inauguration and he would have said, you expect me to give a long flowery speech, but the people put me here for a reason immediately I have to get to work Uh, I have to restore the Bill of Rights I have to get us out of Iraq, Afghanistan get us completely out of the Middle East which he has the power to do as commander in chief, he could have done it in 90 days what what the heck are all the sticky tentacles still doing in the Middle East and then this Syria nonsense and uh, Trump proclaiming that Assad bombed his own people. Well, that makes sense. Yeah, just when things are calming down, you want to uh, you want to set chemical weapons on your own people and have the news come in and film women and children being sarin gassed, and then so you can give the West and give the United States an excuse to come back in and get you. Yeah, um, just sarin gassing your own women and children. That's real strategic to the war effort. Anybody that believes this bullcrap should have their head examined. And you could take that right into the, the Trump and the wall thing. You know, we're fighting this. He, he's trying to get the funding and we've got to get the wall, but he's being blocked. He's always being blocked, being blocked, being blocked. If anything was real, <laughs> he would have gone to the, the West Wing of the White House 20 minutes after the inauguration. And he would have said, I'm, I, this was my main campaign promise. We're going to start building the wall like tomorrow. He doesn't need anybody's permission He doesn't need uh, the Democrats' permission. He controls a $600 billion-plus defense budget. If there were no funds, he takes $5 billion of the $600 plus he controls directly, and he diverts it in the interest of national security to the border, and he begins building the wall. There's nobody that could block them. There's nobody that could stop them. What are they? So, so the Democrats are going to flock to the uh, to the House chamber for impeachment, and somebody could just stand up. And, and that, at that time, remember the Republicans controlled everything. Somebody could stand up and say, "So let me get this straight, Democrats. You're looking to impeach a president who was just elected a few months ago by fulfilling his number one campaign promise." Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. <laughs> he would have start building it. Sure, they would have tried to block it in all the courts. They would have gone to those San Francisco liberal courts and they would have blocked it. And we said, well, so what? What I'm going to... Uh, 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 the Court of Appeals, some some jurisdiction in San Francisco in the Castro District uh, blocked it? Well, so what? You'd say, well, uh, impeach me. I'm not stopping because some some lunatic Court of Appeals in the San Francisco Castro District just blocked me. I'm not stopping it. 
you want, you know, put your army, like I've said this before, but it's, it's a funny mental picture. Put your army of Priuses together and drive to the border and you stop me. Yeah, it's a joke. But no, now the, 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 the wall stuff heats up right when the Republicans have lost the power. Now, they don't control the House and they don't control Nancy Pelosi's back. Why didn't they do it when they had all the elements of power? It's all fake it's 100% a charade, and anybody that's just waiting for Trump to save us, and you believe any of it, really, I, I'm not, I can't help you. It's just so obvious at this point. It's, it's mind-boggling how anybody could believe that anything to do with politics is real.